I don't have the solo today, but as we prepare our hearts and minds as we gather around the Lord's table today, we'll be reading from Matthew 27, 27 through 31. It says, Then Pilate's soldiers took him, took Jesus, into the governor's palace, and the whole company gathered around him. They stripped him of his clothes and put him in scarlet robe on him. Then they made a crown out of thorny branches and put it on his head. They put a stick in his right hand. Long live the king of the Jews, they said. They spat on him. They took the stick and hit him over the head. When they had finished making fun of him, they took the robe off of him and put his own clothes on him and then let him out to be nailed on the cross. <clears throat> of course, we wouldn't do anything like that intentionally. But one wonders sometimes the way Christmas is often celebrated today that if we are not actually making fun of Christ, are we like the Roman soldiers, Matthew describes, guilty of mocking and abusing and crucifying the Son of God? During the Christmas season, as always, we want to keep Christ as the center of our lives and at the heart of the celebration. In the midst of all the hurrying and shopping and wrapping and decorating and visiting, let us be careful not to forget what it's really about. Let us be faithful in taking time to worship and to remember. Reverently now, we pause from the business of the world and from the gaiety of the season as we gather around this table in all sincerity and deep gratitude, let us eat this bread and drink this cup, remembering the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to, to come around your table so graciously provided for us. We thank you for your mercy and grace. We thank you for your son, your baby Jesus, who grew up and became a man and a teacher and a savior, that uh, he went to the cross for the many sins of the world. And as we partake of these emblems, this cup representing his shed blood that was poured out so freely for us and our sins, and this loaf representing his body that stood on, that hung on that cruel cross in our stead. May we truly realize uh, the meaning of Christmas and sacrifice that he had made throughout his entire life. But most important, may we remember his teachings and his words that uh, strengthen us day to day. May each of us be rejuvenated as we pr participate in this communion, and may we be truly blessed by the sermon today. We ask these things in Jesus' name. <laughs> Amen.
pray with me, please? Father God, thank you for this abundant life that you've given us, Father. Father, thank you for coming to this earth as a baby, leading a sinful life, an unsinful life, Father, as an example for us to lead. And thank you, Father, for putting yourself on that cross voluntarily <coughs> and giving up your life for the forgiveness of our sins, Father. And we pray, Father, that we will, we will try to repay as much as we can by leading a life that is glorifying you and lifting you up, Father, and praising you with everything that we do and say. Forgive us our sins, Father. In Christ's holy name we pray. Good morning. All right, so before we get going, I need to clear up some confusion. Next slide, Dave. Is the one to the right? Other oh, right? <laughs> um, just so everyone knows, the orange and white vest is not for OSU. I have not switched to the dark side. Um, it is Whataburger which if you were not aware is the greatest culinary experience known to man. Um, <laughs> uh, so today is the last 
uh, regular or normal weekend in our Promise series. I say regular or normal uh, because if you weren't aware of yet, next Sunday is Christmas Day. So it's going to be a little different. It's not going to be normal, and we'll get to that in a little while. But, you know, we've been exploring the themes of Advent. And if you remember from the beginning, Advent is one of those Christian words that we use to describe the time leading up to the birth of Christ. Right? And we know uh, this, the story very well. And in the first week, one of these things that we discovered <clears throat> is that God's promised hope for all of humanity came in the form of a person. Right? Jesus meets our deepest longings and is the hope for our present and our future. And then in the second week, we looked at the promise of peace right? that was given to the lowly shepherds out in the field. There well, it would be a new government that would come in to pass, that would come and would bring peace to the world. And then last week we discovered deep joy in our hearts and the promise that the Savior of the world was coming. And it's a joy to receive and a joy to share. They're not separate, they go together. Right? It's a joy to receive and a joy to share. And today... Uh, I want to visit the promise of love. <clears throat> There's a familiar de uh, depiction of this love that we talk about at Christmas time and, and Jesus coming into the world. And, and you may even have it displayed in your living room, maybe on a mantle or in the dining room on a table. If you, There's a couple of these depictions out in the foyer. It's what we call the nativity scene. But what is the nativity? Does anybody have an idea of what nativity is? Means It actually comes from the Latin word meaning birth. So the nativity scene is the birth scene of Jesus. Right? This scene is set out each year as a depiction of the birth of the God of the universe. Yahweh, the great I am, as he enters into the world, surrounded by his mom and his earthly father, and then maybe some barnyard animals and some shepherds and angels and, and we see later some wise men. And, and, but in the birth scene, all eyes are fixed on the baby Jesus because, well, it's all about his birth. So before we go any further, let's open up with a word of prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father God, I pray that as we go through our message here this morning, you know, that your message is heard loud and clear today. God, that every ear is made ready to hear that message, every mind made ready to understand that message and every heart made ready to accept your message for us today. God, we thank you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, so within our culture today, uh, there's this new phenomenon that's been taking over. It's been happening for a while, but it seems like it's really become super popular here lately with young couples who find out that they're going to be having a baby called gender reveal parties. I'm sure we've all seen these videos of them. Maybe you've been a part of one. Some of these parties are reaching excess of $10,000 to reveal the gender of the baby. And the couples, right, they have pink and blue cakes baked that give away the uh, secret when they're sliced open. Uh, some couples fill balloons with pink or blue powder, and then they pop them somehow. And uh, some couples have boxes full of pink or blue balloons. And when they get ready to um, reveal it, right, they open the lid, and all the balloons fly to the clap and applause of everyone. And, and you know what? If you, if you can think of it, it's probably been done when it comes to gender reveal parties. Now, maybe you have not been a part of one of these, and so you don't really uh, know the preparation that goes into it, and maybe it's been a while since you've prepared for a new baby in general. But because God's desire for each of us is for Christ to be born within us today, uh, for the love of God to be revealed to the world by the way we live, it's important that we understand God's love and the preparation that's involved in it. So as we begin to finish our Christmas series, what would happen in each of us, right, full of expectation that God could birth something new within us this season, right? What if we began to prepare ourselves for all that God desires to do within each and every one of us? 
Now there's a specific promise given in the Old Testament that is fulfilled in the nativity scene and it's found all the way back in Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold a virgin will be with child and bear a son and she will call his name Emmanuel. Now there would be a sign given to God's people so that they would know that they had not been forgotten in their sinful and broken states of humanity. But instead, when they saw the virgin give birth to a child, they would see the tangible love of God coming into the world to rescue all of them. The instruction given to Isaiah is to be prepared, right? To look forward to. Now in the Gospels, there's two different accounts of the nativity birth. We find it in Matthew and Luke. Each explain it uh, and, and in different ways and how God came into the, really the middle of our mess to be with us because of his love. Right? In the book of Luke, there's captured within the birth narrative a bit of a history and backstory to the nativity. It begins with an angel named Gabriel speaking to a young teenage girl named Mary, which is where we're going to pick up uh, this morning. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 33 now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept <coughs> pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will begin over, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. So this message brought by the angel is that Mary will conceive a child and that she will name him Jesus. Now there's a big key part to this story that's really, really important. Mary is a virgin. right? Mary is also engaged. She has not yet married this man named Joseph, so this announcement must have been a difficult thing to process. You see, when God is ready to do something new in your life, it almost always has a disruption to your life. In a world that is broken and marked by sin, the arrival of love, it's disruptive. Which brings us to an important truth that we all need to understand and kind of look at and really uh, chew on and, and, and ponder. When God shows up, our lives are disrupted. What I mean by that is when God shows up in your life and, and you, you lean into it, you take a posture of submission your life begins to change. The way you thought the world would go and the way you thought you would live your life is disrupted. You get put on a new path. Now Mary's life, it's taking a turn here um, that she could have never expected. I don't think Mary went into the world uh, the rest or any part of her life thinking, you know what? I'm going to be that mom. I'm going to be the one that brings the Savior of the world to the world. I think this caught her by complete surprise. As far as she knew, she was about to marry this nice Jewish man named Joseph, uh, when suddenly she's chosen to give birth to the Savior of the world. This was an obvious disruption to her life. Now, have you ever thought for a moment about Joseph? See. From Joseph's perspective, your fiancé suddenly becomes pregnant, and it's not your baby. You're not even married. So how do you explain this to your family, to your friends, and those who are close to you? Now, you know that Mary told you that an angel told her that this baby is not from another man, but how do you, how do you really know? For Joseph, this was an absolute disruption. For the political parties of the day, King Herod, this was a disruption as well. For this baby to come into the world as the son of God, the king of kings, meant that all the old kings would what? They'd have to go away. 
Their power and authority now <laughs> really meant nothing. This disruption comes because of the promise that God loves his people so much that he would come to dwell with them through this humble young girl. Now, I believe that there are two choices that any person has when it comes to the disruption within our lives. You can either avoid it or you can embrace it. Those are really the only two cho uh, choices you have. I believe that when God is trying to birth something new within us, it will always feel like something confusing. Like, I don't, is that really my call? Am I actually qualified for this? Or maybe it's something hard or something exciting, something inexplicable or, or something uncontrollable. When this happens, what will you do? Will you avoid it or will you embrace it? A few years ago, I experienced the disruptive love of God. Uh, my faith had grown uh, stagnant. I had been going through the motions even though I worked with the church. And, and I know that I'm not alone in this, as many of us sitting in this room and those who are watching online have felt that, that loss of fire from time to time when we become complacent in our lives. See, but I had a friend of mine that challenged me to be in prayer every day with intentionality and then to read through the book of John in the mornings. So I did. And I was diligent with it. I expected God to move and refresh me because he says he will. Right? I was praying when all of a sudden I felt the spirit of God wash over me in a way that I can't really explain. In a split second, I was overwhelmed with love and grace. Right? I, I've not had many experiences like that since, but that moment, I had the deep sense that God was with me and that he loved me, and that sense has never left me. I felt him point out areas in my life where I had uh, made mistakes. I also felt him point out areas where I needed to forgive someone. So I did. I began the process. It was uncomfortable, to say the very least, but it was comforting all at the same time. See, God was birthing within me a newfound passion for him and for those he loved. He met me where I was, and my preparation for his presence paid off. Now, I know that that is not only my story. <coughs> Maybe this morning, as you came to church, you're wrestling with a disruption in your life right now. Maybe it's a new job opportunity, and you're not sure what you're going to do. Maybe it's the loss of some kind, and it's painful. Maybe it's a sin that has finally come to light. It's out in the open, and you're finally going to have to deal with it. Maybe it's a relationship that's hit the dead end. Maybe it's a need that you see around you that you can no longer ignore, and it's overwhelming every moment. These are disruptions. This may be God's grace and his love bringing about something new in your life, which brings you to your two options. Are you going to avoid it or are you going to embrace it? Some of us this morning have spent years avoiding a disruption that God has been trying to use within your life to birth something new and beautiful. My hope and my prayer today would be that across this room and those who are watching online, that there would be people who would stop avoiding the disruptions that God can use to build the kingdom and that you would start embracing them. Like Mary and Joseph in this story, God is wanting to do something through our lives that will change the world. But we must choose how we will respond. Look how Mary responds in Luke 1, 34 through 37. Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. And she who was called barren is now in her sixth month for nothing will be impossible with God. Now, in this disruptive moment in Mary's life, she asks a very valid and fair question. How is this going to happen? 
right? I'm a virgin. That's not how this works. There's no natural way that God could bring about what has been promised. You see, within her mind, and, and most of our minds as well, there could be no new birth because it does not seem humanly possible. And she is right. It is not humanly possible. This is a work of God. Mary had new birth excuses. It's the same thing that happens to us when we come into contact with one of these disruptions. Right? We, we begin to make these new birth excuses. Well, this can't happen. Not with me. I can't do this. I can't do that. And we all have these reasons why God cannot do a new work within us. And I want to speak to those excuses for a moment. I've heard for years, over and over, from people within the church say things like, there's no way God can save this relationship. It's too far gone. There's no way God could love me. I've made too many mistakes. See, I will never see the relationship <coughs> with my son or daughter restored because there's just too much damage done. These are all excuses for why we cannot experience new birth. Like Mary, we point out how, from a human perspective, it does not make sense for God to be able to do a work in and through us. But look how the angel responds to the excuse the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Essentially what the angel is saying, you see Mary, what is impossible for man is possible for God. This is not a work of mere men. This is a work of God. All our excuses are correct and valid about why this Christmas should not be a fresh start and a new birth in our lives. And in, in and of ourselves, it is absolutely impossible. But through the love of God, right, expect, expressed in His miraculous birth, anything is possible. The nativity, this birth, changed the world roughly 1,989 years ago, give or take a year or two on either side. Right? This birth is still changing the world today because the same Spirit of God that came upon Mary is the same Most High God that can overshadow you today. God wants to do a, a birth in you. He wants to bring something new into your life. And it's not about your ability or your effort or your qualifications, your gender, your track record or your status in the church or community. It's simply about seeing that whatever disruption God has allowed or brought into your life is an act of love and is something to be embraced rather than avoided. I think we need to pay attention to Mary's response to the fulfilled promise in Luke chapter 1 verse 38. Mary said, Behold the bond slave of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Mary's response is surrender. It's submission. She opens herself up to whatever God wants to do within her life. All the questions are not answered yet. She doesn't know how or what's going to happen or what the future is going to look like. She simply says, as Jesus would later say, your will be done. When we submit to God, His promises can be fulfilled in and through us. What if this were the kind of posture we committed to this Christmas season, one of submission to God? How would our lives be different? Right? Our submission to God has everything to do with what we perceive to be our greatest need. I love what uh, Pastor Max Lucado said. If our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness, so God sent us a savior. The world's greatest need was and still is today the love and grace of God. So Mary was willing to take on the disruption that giving birth to the Savior of the world was no doubt going to come into her life. So, if this is the posture that we are supposed to choose, submission to God and His call in our lives, and if we, let's focus it down a little bit. This Christmas season, 
How might God use right, us to birth something new in those around us? I like this because the message uh, of the birth of Jesus uh, was not intended to change Mary and Joseph's life alone. Right? The birth of Jesus was meant to change the world through you. The kingdom does not look like the kingdom we have grown accustomed to. This kingdom uh, that we're looking forward to is dedicated to turning the world on its head. Right? And healing the broken and rescuing the lost. Love is the norm in the kingdom of God. And it is because a reality we receive the love of God for us and offer the love of God to others. We're told to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Everything that makes you who you are. And then you are to love others. Consider the ways you could do something new to bring love to someone else. Maybe it's inviting a neighbor to eat a meal and developing a new relationship. Maybe it's beginning a new family tradition that puts Jesus first instead of the presence. Maybe it's inviting that difficult relative or neighbor over for Christmas dinner to say what's happened in the past is in the past. I want to see what the future holds. This is what happens to us when we believe the good news of Jesus' birth as more than just a historical fact but also a promise that affects our present. It brings joy, peace, hope, and love into our world. Our lives can be changed, and in doing so, we can have an eternal impact on the lives of those around us. It's easy this time of year to get lost in the busyness of the season, isn't it? I'm assuming everyone sitting in this room has already thought this morning about how crazy this next week is going to be. I've got to go to this Christmas and that Christmas. Then we've got to go to this plan and that work party and this party and, and that. And then we've got to do this and we've got to do that. And in your schedule, where is Jesus? It's time that we make time for him. Remember, this time of the year isn't about the presence under the tree. It's about the present that hung on a tree almost 2,000 years ago. The gift of love hope, peace, and joy that he has brought into your life and your life and your life is now telling you to bring that same peace, love, joy, and hope into someone else's life. In a moment, we're going to close in a song of worship, and I want you to worship God for who he is. I know I say that every single week, and if we start doing it, maybe I'll say something different. Probably not. But I want you to stand, and I want you to sing with all you've got. Worship him for the king he is. Before we get there, let me close with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you for this morning. God, I thank you for this opportunity that we have to come together. God, to have your word speak life into our lives. And God, I pray that as we go through the rest of today and this next week, no matter how busy we are, that we never miss an opportunity to share your peace with the woes around us, the hope, joy, and love that is found in you and you alone. And God, I pray that everyone would put themselves into a posture of submission this season to be used as you deem them to be used, no matter what that is. God, that we would stop avoiding the call and stop embracing the call. God, we thank you. We love you. It's in Jesus' most holy and precious name we pray. Amen. If you would please stand and join me in song 602, I have decided to follow Jesus.